I'll start it off just by saying thanks very much for welcoming us here. Um, looking very much forward to learning more about South Bend, helping you communicate everything that's great about South Bend and the surrounding community. But I'd first like to touch on, um, you got a major event coming up. You got a major milestone coming up in the history of South Bend. Um, tell me about the whole 150th anniversary. That's right. So South Bend is at the beginning of a year-long celebration of the 150th anniversary of the city. Our city was incorporated in its current form officially in 1865, and that means we got a pretty big birthday coming up. Uh, May 22nd is the actual date, but we're using the whole year for all kinds of events from community and educational events to arts and recreation events, and then it's going to culminate uh, on that birthday weekend, which happens to be Memorial Day as well. We're going to have live outside concerts. We're going to have events. It's, it's ideal timing, and it really uh, is, is just, uh, I think, really suitable in terms of the trajectory of the city as well. You know, uh, this is a city that's had a lot of ups and downs. It's evolved in a, a very rich and very complex way over the years, and I truly believe that this decade is going to re be remembered as the decade when South Bend really turned forward, uh, turned its, uh, its trajectory in a new direction. And there's no better way to celebrate that than some of the events and some of the activities we have planned for the 150th. Um, why is it that you think right now is that turning point? What's the fulcrum that um, collectively got together to, to shift that? Well, you know, we've spent the last 50 years sorting out what our economy is going to be if we're not going to be making cars anymore. It was 1963 when Studebaker left, and at the time a lot of people were questioning whether the city could ever survive. Now, the truth is that the city can survive and thrive even if Studebaker is not coming back, and it's taken a generation, maybe two generations, to come to terms with that and realize we can actually be even better off as long as we keep an eye on the future. What's happening now that's so exciting is a combination of economic development that's true to our roots, a lot of advanced manufacturing and innovation going on there, as well as a lot of things happening in fields that didn't even exist when I was born, like data centers and data analytics. So that's given us the economic foundation to really look to the future. And at the same time, and maybe even more importantly, the, the city started believing in itself again. I don't know how else to put it. You, you go downtown, you see people wearing the I Heart SB buttons and you can just feel a vibe and it's everybody from young professionals and hipsters in the downtown area to uh, retirees who are coming to embrace city living now that our city is starting to feel like a city again. What, um, what are some of those milestones that you've seen recently? You had the FedEx announcement, you've had some other economic development groups, you got an art um, law facility that's getting built out here. Tell me some of those signs of investment that you see from others. That's right, our economic development team has been on a roll. Uh, again, part of it's more traditional job growth. You got logistics happening with FedEx announcing a major distribution facility here. You got manufacturing companies like Nello adding hundreds of jobs here, uh, making cell phone towers. We're exporting cars to China from this area uh, with uh, AM General, which is headquartered in South Bend as a big facility in Mishawaka, making Mercedes. Uh, people think of Mercedes made in Germany, imported to the U.S. Well, these are made in the U.S., exported to Asia. Uh, so it shows that we can win in a globalized economy. Then you got things that are a little more cutting edge, unusual, a little newer, uh, like the effort to redevelop the old Hoffman Hotel with tax credits that will support artists uh, moving in and revitalizing downtown through, uh, through their residency. You know, um, we've learned when it comes to bringing downtown back, uh, you want to have those stores, you want to have the restaurants, you want to have the bars, but really you got to have the rooftops. You got to have people living downtown. That's how you get the chicken and egg cycle going in the right direction. So seeing the renewed demand, the renewed interest in actually living in the heart of the city has marked a real turning point in the last couple of years and I think it's only going to gather and accelerate in the years to come. What, um, we're going to come to South Bend next year um, and I'd like your prognostication for how much good we're going to find. Well, um, think, touch uh, on some of the things that we might experience as we learn more about South Bend and the greater area. Yeah, I think your organization has great timing. Uh, just like I feel that I have great timing as mayor to uh, be serving at, at this moment in the life of the city. It's just an extraordinary time. Uh, there are a lot of wins that we've racked up recently, the new jobs, uh, some things happening in the downtown area, but we got a lot more 
in the near future. More public art's going to happen, beginning with the installation of the uh, river light sculpture that's going to light up the river, actually throw light from one side of the river to the other in an interactive feature that we're installing as part of the South Bend 150th anniversary. Uh, you're going to see a lot more investments in parks. We went almost 40 years without a parks bond in this city, but now is just the right time if you look at the markets and you look at the city's finances to make some real investments in the bonds. Another thing we're doing is we're reimagining the way that downtown streets ought to be configured. And we're doing this out in the neighborhoods too, especially on the west side. Making sure that the streets have a complete streets philosophy, which means that it's not only a good uh, way for cars to get around, but it's also accommodating pedestrians, bicycles, and that it's a, a place you want to spend time. That's what I mean when I talk about feeling like a city again. And you're coming at, at just the moment that that's catching fire. What, um, what would you say three years in now to your experience as being one of those young gun mayors that came onto the scene, uh, I think there's five of you That's across right. the state of Indiana, um, what would you say your experience has been? Obviously you bring a breath of energy, drive, enthusiasm for the position. Um, what challenges did you face and how did, how did you individually or collectively work through those? You know, it's been really fun to come into office at a time when a number of other young mayors were taking office around the state of Indiana. The nearest one is uh, Mayor Blair Milo in Laporte, who's a good friend. And uh, we got others throughout the state. And it's great just to be able to compare notes, uh, see how things look through their eyes, because we face a lot of the same challenges. But I think we also came in on the same kind of wave of hope for the future. You know, a community doesn't uh, pick a rookie and put him in unless they want to send us certain message about uh, being future oriented and thinking about where our city's headed in a way that's embracing innovation, uh, questioning habit, and looking for creativity. And I think you saw that right here in South Bend and, and in the other communities that chose younger leaders as well. Uh, it's not necessarily one generation versus another. As a matter of fact, uh, we did better among senior citizens than almost any other group in the city. It's about looking to the future and trying not to be bogged down by some of the strings attached that uh, uh, come with being on the scene for a long time. Uh, now we've benefited from having people in the administration of all ages, uh, folks who've been on the scene since before I was born, uh, practicing their craft, whether it's in engineering or, uh, or uh, public works or, or, or parks or other areas of the city, uh, others who had never even considered public service before I asked them to serve, came in from the private sector, or like me, were, were pretty young and pretty new. So we've been able to build a really broad-based, diverse coalition of leaders, stepping up and taking the future of our city forward. But uh, it's been great fun to not be the only young person uh, in the mix and to compare notes with some of the others. So a little bit of young thinking, not necessarily young, um, you know, in age. The important thing is to have a fresh approach, and sometimes a fresh approach comes from somebody with a lot of experience. Sometimes a fresh approach takes somebody uh, with new eyes who, who hasn't been working on it before to ask the maybe sometimes the silly questions, um, but that haven't been asked in a long time. So around here we always say, uh, if it's always been done that way, why? And if there's a good reason, we'll keep doing it. But if there isn't, it's not a good enough reason just to say we're doing it because we've always done it that way. Yeah. Uh, what, you got the American flag behind you. Um, you recently got back from service overseas. Tell me about that experience and the respect it reinstilled for you and those that are going out to protect the opportunity that you have here in South Bend. Well, yes, uh, I spent most of 2014 uh, on military duty and uh, spent most of that in Afghanistan. I was deployed as a reservist. I think it's important to mention that nearly half a million people now have been mobilized as members of the Guard or the Reserve. So uh, I'm nothing special. I'm nothing in unusual in that regard. And everybody who gets deployed is leaving behind something important to them, a family, a job, a place in the community. My deployment was obviously a little bit higher profile just because of my job, uh, but fundamentally not any different. Uh, the thing that really uh, stuck with me and I think touched me through the deployment was, first of all, my relationship to South Bend only got deeper. I was actually met on the plane by a, a friend of mine from high school, a, an Air Force officer, uh, who realized I was coming in and, and met me on the tarmac at Bagram Airfield the moment I first touched down in Afghanistan. And throughout the experience, was, whether it was running into people I knew from here, uh, Facebook messages, care packages in the mail, I was always reminded that you're never alone and, and that your community comes with you. The other thing I really felt was just a sense of a relationship to South Bend and, and a relationship to home as part of why we serve in the first place. And I think people go into the military and go to places like Afghanistan and Iraq in order to protect places like South Bend and Indiana. And it's all part of the same idea of service. And we all 
find different ways to make ourselves useful. Uh, mine obviously created a little bit of tension between uh, my, my job for the city and, and my job for the country, but uh, the community here was enormously respectful, enormously supportive uh, through that whole thing. And I'm also very proud of the job that uh, the team did here in South Bend, handling all the things that, uh, that came their way during the time that I was away. What, um, what would you say are the highlights of the year coming up outside of the 150th anniversary that you want to um, see come to fruition still in 2015? Well, we're looking for more good announcements on the jobs and economic development front. We've got some more deals in the hopper that we think are going to come through. We're going to actually see uh, a lot of the physical growth. We've already broken ground and done some of the business deals, but seeing the physical growth in Ignition Park, seeing things like ND Turbo, this uh, turbo machinery research project that uh, we're collaborating with GE on with help from the state uh, and the university is going to be very exciting. Uh, it's going to be the early phase of the smart streets effort, although that's going to take more than one year to really deliver on. A and we will see some uh, good things happening in parks, although again, that's just the beginning and I'm really excited for the years to come. Uh, downtown's going to look a little different. You'll start to see more projects, uh, including that Hoffman Hotel I mentioned coming to fr fruition. And uh, we hope also some very positive steps for the Chase Tower, one of the largest buildings in our city, one that's faced a lot of challenges, but is finally getting some of the investment that it needs to be the great building that it wants was and, and can be again. Bottom line is I think we, we are going to remember these years and 2015 is right in the middle of them as this hinge point, this moment when our city's trajectory really started to take off in a good way. Um, two more things I'll touch on. Nonprofit groups tend to be where we focus a heck of a lot of our attention because they're individually and collectively helping to transform cities. Take care of those that are underserved and also help those that are right at the uh, median sort of make their next step up into productivity or positivity. Um, tell me some of the leading groups that you interact with on the nonprofit side that really get behind the city effort, city's efforts. Well, you know, South Bend has been blessed with just a tremendous array of great organizations dedicated to public service and contributing in different ways. First of all, we've got five colleges and universities, uh, Notre Dame, which is the best known, uh, but also St. Mary's, Holy Cross, IU has a campus here, and Bethel, technically just across the street in Mishawaka, but very much part of our community too, uh, Bethel College, which does a lot of great uh, uh, training. So uh, you look at that plus the role of Ivy Tech, and first of all, just a great texture of universities and colleges. And uh, if you can pick one thing to put in the middle of a city, uh, I think a mayor wants a college or university. We've got two phenomenal hospitals. We've got Memorial Hospital located right here in the heart of the city. And then in the region we have uh, St. Joe, which also does a lot of good work uh, right here in South Bend with their clinic on the west side. Uh, then you've got uh, direct service organizations. You've got uh, uh, the great work, and uh, it's almost hard to, uh, to think of a list because there's so many, whether it's uh, organizations catering to the needs of uh, our most vulnerable, uh, the world-class center for the homeless, the work that uh, Hope Ministries does, uh, the, the Miller uh, Center for Homeless Veterans, which I think is a, an example for the whole country in terms of how to get it right uh, when you're trying to take care of the needs of homeless veterans. Uh, you got uh, recreational opportunities provided by organizations like the Croc Center uh, on the west side with a phenomenal facility uh, for working out, but also for community events, uh, the YMCA and, and many others, uh, too numerous to name. Uh, and then you've got uh, a lot of uh, educational organizations. Uh, we've got uh, uh, a big push, especially right now, on mentoring. We've set up a website, mentorsouthbend.com. We're trying to urge people to become mentors. There's more than 100 kids still waiting for that opportunity. But thanks to Big Brothers Big Sisters, as well as uh, the Education Foundation Mentoring Program, which actually brings people into the schools uh, to spend time with kids. We're making a real difference in the lives of those young people. So those are just a few that come to mind uh, and there are uh, dozens, probably hundreds more that I might mention. And they all uh, do something to make our community better. And they also uh, are doing things that uh, we would have to do otherwise uh, out of the government and probably not as well uh, because we wouldn't have the resources. So uh, everything these great nonprofits do uh, is something that uh, taxpayers no longer have to worry about supporting. And some of this stuff pays for itself many times over. I uh, think about the work that's uh, happening uh, in our minority communities, uh, the work that the Minority Health Coalition does, the work that happens in and around our uh, Martin Luther King and, and Charles Black centers, uh, the work of La Casa de Amistad, which supports our growing Latino community, uh, which is adding so much to the vitality of South Bend in an area that was always traditionally immigrants. It used to be uh, Czech and Polish young Hungarian immigrants. Now it's immigrants speaking Spanish. Uh, but the same story of people coming to uh, make a better life and in the meantime uh, making 
making America a better place through their efforts. Um, uh, there's actually two more subjects I'll talk about. Um, one is you got the Cubs coming. Uh, right. Tell me a little bit about what the infusion of that Cubs mania um, brings to South Bend. You know, South Bend has been lucky ever since 1987. We have uh, had uh, uh, formerly Kovaleski Stadium, now Four Winds Field. Uh, we got this great ballpark, and uh, Andrew Berlin has uh, made a lot of investments since the time that he purchased the local team in that ballpark to make it just a, a terrific facility. It's a lot of fun, a great place to watch a ball game. It's actually a pretty fun place to be, even for people who don't care about baseball. Good place to grab a beer or a hot dog or take kids into the bouncy house or uh, through the water park. Uh, the the uh, splash pad that we have set up there and there's more where that came from uh, so it's already been uh, doing uh, so much for the community uh, and so much uh, in recent years as we've had these investments but uh, what's going to take it to the next level is this announcement about becoming the South Bend Cubs. Prior to that, we were affiliated with Arizona Diamondbacks, certainly a great, uh, great ball club. But uh, to be attached to a major league baseball team that's right up the road, right in our neighborhood, is a really special thing for South Bend. And you can feel the energy, you can feel the excitement, uh, and I think it's uh, it's just going to make people's relationship to their hometown minor league ball team that much more special. To have Driving by there this morning, Cubs. seeing the Cubs, you know, logo on the big electronic billboard. Board. There's yeah. definitely like, there's a spark to it. Oh, it's great. It's uh, it's just something that means a lot to people here. So many people here have that tie to uh, to Chicago baseball and, and to the Cubs in particular. And uh, so to have that connect up with our own hometown 1A team and and you know such a fun thing to do. It's it's great for the family. It's very affordable, uh, and it's become uh, just a great touchstone for the revitalization of the whole downtown area. Uh, so I expect to see more good things happening in the area immediately around the ballpark and. Uh, uh, having that Cubs affiliation just, just takes us to the next level on what's already been a great success. Last question I'll touch on is you've been, uh, along with people like uh, Mayor Blair, very early and eager um, users, advocates, um, communicators via social media. Um, you, I tend to find political folks in one of three camps. Number one, don't understand it. Number two, I understand it and I really don't like it. <laughs> or number three, I understand it, it's got its drawbacks, but it has tremendous attributes as well to be able to allow me to directly communicate with um, our citizens. And you seem to be in that third category where you see the utilization of it. Um, tell me a little bit about why. Well, you know, uh, I come from a generation uh, that speaks social media as a native language. I, I remember when Facebook was created, it was by some kids in the dorm next to mine, and, and I think we signed up for it the day after it started. Not because we thought it was going to turn into something very big, but uh, just for fun. So to see that evolve, I think we've really grown up with that, uh, that social media platform and culture, and it's amazing to uh, meet kids who are younger than me who don't know it any other way. Uh, the truth is, like any tool, like any platform, like any forum, it's only as good as the people who use it and the choices they make. Uh, but I think we're a community full of uh, people who want to engage, want to talk to each other, and they want to engage their government. So the most success we've had with social media is using it to connect with people when they're sharing issues or problems or concerns. And uh, it also just puts a more human face on that relationship. You know, city government, even in a small city, uh, can be an intimidating thing. It can seem uh, like it's got high walls and it's distant for people who are trying to get their problems solved. I I can't tell you how many times I've had some tweet or some Facebook post by somebody who's pretty mad about an issue. Uh, and uh, I write back and I engage and I say, hey, here, here's how we're dealing with it. Uh, can we do better or would you like to help? And it's amazing the effect that has. It just changes the conversation because now uh, they realize that we do pay attention to that, that we care what they think. They have a voice. Exactly. And it gives people a voice. And so if we use social media not just as a way to kind of blast out uh, you know, propaganda, but, but really as a way to gather information to make better decisions and then to better convey why we're making the choices we have. Uh, I think it just makes everybody's relationship to their government uh, and the government belongs to the people, right? Uh, this moves the government closer to people and that can only make us better off. Mm -hmm.